and I'm about to introduce the second strategy as practice webinar uh, for the Strategic uh, Activities and Practices Academy of Management Interest Group. Um, my webinar is following Paula Jarzakowski's, which should be available on the Connect AOM SAP site. And um, I'm foreseeding David Seidel's uh, webinar, which will be coming up in a couple of weeks. So I hope you'll be able to look at it, all three of these webinars and see them as a whole. There may be more coming on. In a moment, you should be able to see my screen um, with my PowerPoint slides. I'm going to talk about strategies, practice, micro and macro. And there's a uh, italics in the and. And basically, that's to say um, that we should be doing both more micro studies of strategies practice and more macro perspectives as well. So it's not, not to exclude one or the other, but just to say we can do both. And in fact, we probably should do more of the macro. OK, I've got an agenda coming up here, I think, uh, if I can get, make it work. Give me a minute. What I'd like first to do is just mention that, as I said, it's both and, both micro and macro. And I want to absolutely emphasize that strategies practice comes in many, many varieties. I've just given here a definition of strategies practice and its ter terrain from the Cambridge Handbook of Strategies Practice, the edition which came out in 2015, the second edition. And then it says strategies practice research focuses on the micro level social activities, processes and practices that characterize organizational strategy and strategizing. Well, you see the micro word there, but what I want to point to and underline perhaps here is the emphasis on practices as part of that definition does point as well to macro practices. And macro practices is one of the things I want to talk about and uh, generally encourage further study of. I'll explain what macro practices are in a, in a little bit. Meanwhile, I want to emphasize that there's lots of ways of doing strategies practice research. And if you think that the, the amount of scholarship in this area, there've been 6,130 papers uh, counted on Google Scholars in the last 10 years, Google Scholar in the last 10 years. If you think about the number of papers in this area, um, there must be a lot of variety, and that's a great thing. So I'm definitely not pushing a single view on strategy as practice. There are lots of ways of doing it. Let me just turn to my agenda. I want to start by introducing macro and micro as two theoretical categories, and then move on how to relate the two to each other. So in particular, how to relate micro activities, sometimes called strategy work or strategy praxis with a X, and macro practices, practices which stretch across many organizations. So what I should be looking at is how to relate the micro to the macro. That leads me, I think, naturally to discuss what are we trying to explain when we do strategy as practice research? What's it for? What's its purpose? How are we trying to help people? So what are we trying to explain? And then I think that leads us to, to connections with other theoretical traditions. And the two theoretical traditions I'm going to emphasize here, the strategy process tradition and the institutional theory tradition. So both process and institutional theory will be coming up a little bit later. And finally, the last topic, which in a way relates to everything which precedes, what kinds of methodologies might we use in strategies practice research? Is it just a qualitative approach to strategy? Is it ethnomethodology that we should use? Or is it a broader, wider range? On the whole, I'm going to suggest a broader range is perfectly appropriate. According to the uh, answer to your question, what are we trying to explain? Okay, so that's the agenda. I'm just going to mention that before we, uh, before I, get, I actually start the main substance of the uh, webinar, please do send a few questions in as we go along. I shan't be able to respond to all the questions, but we're trying to collect the questions and I should be able to respond to some of the 
the common themes or the more salient issues about halfway through this webinar. And there'll also be a chance perhaps to connect as well at the end to a few more questions. Okay, so there's the agenda. I'm going to start with micro and macro as theoretical categories. So before that, I ought to mention that this also reflects my own my, uh, trajectory. I started very much with a micro perspective. I have moved increasingly towards a more macro perspective. If you um, think at the beginning of this arrow, way back in 1996, I was describing strategy as a kind of work and talking about strategizing and the work which is going on in inside organizations in particular. Other people since then, Paula Jarzakowski, Julia Balligan and David Seidel and others have picked up some of those themes. But where I've arrived at more recently, and I've just got a book coming out uh, on this opening strategy with Oxford University Press, I've moved increasingly to a concern with macro practices. There I look at the rise of macro practices such as long range planning, strategic planning, strategic management, and something I call open strategy um, over a long period of time since the 1960s and across many, many organizations, both in the United States, in Europe, the UK, and more widely still. So what I'm looking at there very much is something like strategic management or strategic planning as a macro practice which spans decades and many, many organizations in many, many countries. So I've moved from strategies, practices, strategizing in particular organizations towards a perspective on, on practices, societal practices, which cross many, many organizations. So that's by way of micro and macro um, in my personal career. But I might just now uh, explain what I mean by those as theoretical categories. It's a bit like the distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics talks about what organizations, particular firms are doing and deciding to do. Macroeconomics talks about the whole aggregation of all the firms, the whole economy um, across many, many firms, many, many organizations. Here in strategy as practice, I'm going to suggest there's something we might call micro strategy as practice focusing on what's happening inside particular organizations. So that might be a strategy retreat or a strategy away day, the sorts of things that have been studied by Jerry Johnson and colleagues. The strategic planning process, something which has been touched on by people like uh, Floyd and, and, and so on and so forth. Or a particular strategy conversation that Dalva Samus Fredericks, for instance, has looked at little fragments of a, a, um, a board level conversation, which are analyzed in great detail. All that's happening inside a particular organization. Macro uh, refers to what happens across many organizations, as in strategic planning practices, strategic planning practices, which are more or less exercised and followed um, in many organizations across many countries over a long period of time. But there are practices like strategy retreat practices where there are certain things that most strategy retreats or strategy workshops share more or less in common. They often go away to an off-site position. They often use an uh, external facilitator. They'll often use certain tools such as SWOT analysis and all that sort of thing. Um, those are commonalities which cross many organizations. So there may be a particular strategy retreat happening inside a particular organization. They exemplify general macro practice, which happens in many, many organizations. And similarly, though we might have a strategy conversation, which we analyze in a micro way inside a particular organization, that strategy conversation is using common discursive practices. It might be talk of strategic missions and visions. It might be talk about competitive advantage, which reflect general strategy discursive practices, which are used in many, many organizations. So micro as a theoretical category refers to what's happening inside particular organizations, 
macro is what happens across many organizations. Sometimes I put mention meso here. Sometimes we use the word meso to talk about outcomes at the level of an organization unit as a whole. That might be firm level performance, profitability. It might be a pattern of decisions, the emergent strategy in, in the sort of terms that Henry Mintzberg would talk about it. We see, I think, increasing interest in macro SAP or macro practices. And here I'm, I'm pointing to Paula Jarzakowska's book, with Rebecca Bednarak and Paul Spee, who looked at the way in which um, there is a, a set of macro insurance practices in the global insurance industry. And I've already mentioned my work on macro strategic planning practices, macro strategic management practices in the book Opening Strategy. So I'll come back to Paula's work, Making a Market for Acts of God in a moment, and I'll also return to my own book later. But those are the two main theoretical categories I want to touch on. Why am I emphasizing macro and macro SAP? Because as David Seidel and I have, have written before in a paper in organization studies back in 2014, it's quite important to avoid micro isolationism. And by micro isolationism, we're referring to the tendency in some studies to explain local activities, local strategy activities or local strategy practice in their own terms. In other words, what's happening in that particular organization. Our argument is, in fact, that, that, that typically what happens in a particular organization is drawing upon practices, discursive practices about strategy or strategy tools like SWOT analysis or Boston Consulting Group uh, boxes or Porter's Five Forces or talk of red ocean and blue oceans and things like that, which are not specific to that particular organization. And therefore, you can't wholly explain what's happening in a particular micro setting uh, in terms of what's happening in that particular organization. The inspiration and the legitimization of what's happening also draws upon macro practices which are outside the, the organization, the discourse of strategy and the kinds of legitimacy that that discourse brings to the situation. Uh, so what we do in that paper, David Seidel and I, is point to the fact that many people will do draw, and we point to certain articles in organization studies which have appeared over the years, um, which do exactly this, um, do draw on ontologies, that's theories of what, what the world is like, which are larger than just organizational. So we point to the Foucauldian tradition, critical realist tradition, uh, Gadensian tradition, Bourdieuian tradition, and so on and so forth. We also point to Shatsky and actor network theory, which are less well represented, at least in organization studies, to the point where we are writing in 2014. Um, these traditions, whether they adopt what we call tall ontologies or flat ontologies, whether they emphasize sayings, that's discourse, or doings, more material activities, they all make reference, all extend beyond the particular organizational unit. They're all, in that sense, consistent with a macro SAP view of the world. And we, we see those studies um, as particular models for ways of doing or adopting a more macro approach to SAP. I'll be looking at Andrea Herapath's article in a moment. You'll see her in the top right, adopting a tall ontology, focusing on the doings, the doings of, in fact, organizational politics, taking a critical realist perspective. Okay, But you can look up all those other studies at your leisure later, perhaps. Okay, So this takes us back to the relationships between the macro and the micro, or, or micro activities and macro practices. Here I'm pointing to Andrea's Herapath's article in the loop, a realist approach to structure and agency in the practice of strategy. What she does is she takes, in a sense, a top-down view. She looks at the societal level, 
the National Health Service in Wales, which is our, our national um, uh, system for the delivery of health care, and the Welsh politics, the politics of Wales, where she is studying a particular set of, of hospitals. And what she shows in a particular health authority, that is, set of hospitals, is how the strategizing activity drew on discourses to do with the Welsh, that's uh, the, the local um, regional uh, politics, and more widespread national health service rhetorics about public health, public care, and a certain kind of ideology which is associated with the national health service in the United Kingdom. And what she shows is basically that the strategizing activities within the health authority cannot really be understood or explained without an understanding of the National Health Service ideology and local Welsh politics and discourse. So what she's showing is that macro perspective of the National Health Service and Welsh politics is really important in understanding what's happening in the micro perspective, the micro um, site or of the health authority. Now, pa Paula Jarzakowski and her colleagues take a slightly different perspective of relating um, the micro to the macro by starting at the micro level. And what they show in their book, Making a Market for Acts of God, is how the global insurance markets and its practices are enacted constantly through the activity in local situations all around the world, from Bermuda to Pakistan and, and London, um, through the activity, the local activity of particular individuals and groups of activity, uh, groups of individuals. So what they're showing is that global insurance markets and their practices working around the world are created in local activity, a strategizing activity in many locations um, within insurance businesses scattered around the world. So from the, there, the relationship between activities and practice is moves from micro to macro, a kind of upward movement. What I'm going to suggest is that we can also we can um, look at the relationship between the micro and the macro as a more reciprocal. So Paula Jarzakowski looked at bottom up, Andrea Herapath looked at uh, top down, and each of those helped them explain very appropriately what, what their basic um, empirical phenomenon was. In my book, Opening Strategy, I've tended to take a more reciprocal approach, trying to think about the creation of particular societal practices, such as strategic planning, over long periods of time within a professional field, the professional field of strategy consultants, academics, and managers. And they do that through specific episodes of strategy activity. Uh, that might be new conceptions of what strategy should be, how it should be done, or by the creation of new strategy departments within large corporations, such as General Electric and Shell in my book, or the creation of new strategy consulting firms, Boston Consulting Group at one point, or Stratagos and Gemini during the 1990s, and so on and so forth. So what I look at, if you look at ha what happens is practices are born by practitioners, the two converge in practice, episodes of strategy activity, the creation of new firms or new concepts, and they, they, they create new practices which are carried on to the next episode. The three strategic planning, or sorry, the three strategy macro practices I look at are strategic planning, strategic management, and open strategy. One could, of course, conceive of other large macro practices um, to consider as well, but uh, those are the three that I, I focus on in the book. And what you see is they exist over very long periods of time. These are not local and they're not transient, okay? And they're what I would call macro SAP. They're concerned with the development, spread, and use of macro practices which occur across many organizations over long periods of time. And I describe this as happening within strategy as a, with a capital S, in other words, the professional field of strategy, okay? So, if you look at this in the book, you have, um, we, we, I look at specifically three episodes, 
where you can consider strategic planning and strategic management and then open strategy as created through the practice of particular practitioners, um, uh, Boston Consulting Group and Bruce Henderson were important in the 1960s in the creation of strategic planning. Uh, um, uh, McKinsey and people like that were very important in the creation of strategic management in the late, late 1970s. Going through to people like uh, Hamel and Prahler had with Gemini and then Stratagos creating strategic management as far or developing it into the 1990s as well. So what you see is particular individuals creating firms, generating concepts um, through their praxis. And with that, they create practices which cover many organizations over extended periods of time. Now, I'm getting a few questions in. Um, so, uh, and quite tough questions. So I'm gonna to turn to, to those. So I've got some questions coming in. I've got one here. How does opportunity formation or creation as a supposedly non-strategic idea tie into this recursive relationship between micro and macro in SAP research? How does opportunity formation creation as a supposedly non-strategic idea tie into the recursive relationship between micro and macro in SAP research? Well, that's a hard one. So what I'm thinking about, if I, I think about the book, um, opening strategy is the opportunity for creating new practice and strategy dependent upon changing uh, forces. I, I, I talked particularly about organizational forces, technological forces and societal forces. And what happened there is there create opportunities for creating new strategy practices as organizations change. So for instance, the creation of strategic management um, was facilitated by new technologies for the communication of strategy internally. It was also facilitated by a change in managerial education, so societal change, better educated middle managers who were able to manage strategically. And it was also um, uh, prompted by changing nature of organizations. Basically, by the 1980s, organizations had got rather large and needed to accelerate the pace of change. The strategic management was a technique for that. So uh, McKinsey saw that opportunity and during the 1980s um, helped to create a, the practice of strategic management in response to those changing forces. So I'm not sure I would say any, anything is necessarily non-strategic. It becomes an opportunity. And what happened in McKinsey was a micro entrepreneurism. They, they saw an opportunity, they seized it and developed it. And that became a macro practice over time. So I'd say that we, we can, as it were, see a non strategic idea uh, or, or, or strategic opportunities um, being created through micro level work within McKinsey, which created or helped to create a macro practice such as strategic management. That was a tough question. Um, I'm looking forward to more questions coming in. I hope I more or less answered that. Um, and with that, I think probably I should go back to the main um, thread of the webinar. Okay. So if you remember the agenda, I think I started by saying we will look at micro and macro as theoretical categories. And we think about the relationship of micro and macro. And there are at least three ways of doing that. Uh, there's the sort of approach that Andrea Herapath was saying, was proposing in her article, which is largely top down. There's the work that uh, Paula Jarzakowski and colleagues was, were doing with the insurance industry, which is largely bottom up. And there's my work, which is suggesting there's a possibilities also of seeing a reciprocal relationship in which micro work creates macro practices, which then are carried into future uh, episodes of micro work. So what is SAP trying to explain? I think there's lots of things that uh, strategies, practice, research can try to explain and distinctive things. 
things that are maybe conventional or orthodox mainstream strategy research wouldn't think first of trying to do. So in orthodox strategic management research, I think the key question is firm financial performance or some performance metric, whether it's return on capital or share price performance or something like that, or even simply survival. Strategies practice can do that. It hasn't done as much as it should. I've tried a little bit to do that in some work on open strategy, which has appeared in Strategic Management Journal a couple of years ago, work with Bashak Yakis Douglas and John Arn. And we've looked there at um, strategy practices, open strategy practices, how they may affect share prices. And we find they do. But I'd say that's not been a dominant thread in strategy as practice research. There's an opportunity there to do a lot more. What I think strategy as practice research is particularly good at doing is thinking about the skills of particular practitioners. They might be particular groups of managers or strategy consultants, um, and think about how they can be more effective in their particular episodes, strategizing episodes. So people bring out discursive skills of practitioners in particular moments. I think of the work of Linda Rouleau or Dalva Samuel Fredericks as showing how skill with the discourse can really make uh, a difference to the success of managers in pushing their strategic issues over time. There's also work on new practices. I've talked about open strategy. But we can think of our work on new practices within the insurance industry, the creation of new practices over time, and their spread and introduction across many, many firms. That's important. There's other work which is perhaps less uh, fully developed, and that's on practice impacts. People have shown increasing concern, I think, about the effect of strategy practices upon society as a whole. I think of Pankash Gamowat's work in uh, Business History Review, for instance, on how new economy practices have impacted, uh, in fact, the world economy, um, and leading to the dot-com crisis. There have been uh, quite a lot of work, too, emerging recently since the global financial crisis on how strategy practices may have been implicated in those as well. So we can look at practitioner effectiveness, what makes a skillful practitioner, and we can look at practice entrepreneurism or innovation, the creation of new practices, and we can look at the repercussions of practices going far beyond um, the impacts on particular firms, but the impacts upon whole economies. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do. Paula Jozakowski, Sarah Kaplan, David Seidel, and myself um, provide that basic model, which you'll probably recognize as a variant on the practices, practitioners, and praxis model, where we look at what practices are available, who, who's in, involved, and the practices they use, all leading to certain kinds of outcomes. Firm performance, strategic choices, project or strategic issue outcomes, the success of a particular strategic issue, actor outcomes, the effectiveness of a particular practitioner, field level outcomes, the broader societal impacts, and so on and so forth. All of those, I think, are legitimate, even urgent issues for strategies, practice researchers to try to explain. In other words, I think the great virtue of strategy as practice is it has a very, very broad set of things it can contribute to. So that's what SAP is trying to explain. That was another of my strategy, um, strategies practice webinar agenda items. I think we can turn to the next one. And I think that follows quite logically. And that's the relationship with other research traditions. I'm going to point to two. First, the strategy process research tradition and second, the institutional theory research tradition. Uh, a couple of years ago, or a year ago, we had a, a special issue on strategy process and strategy practice. Strategy practice. 
edited by uh, Rob Bergelman, Stephen Floyd, Tony Larminen, Saki Mantri, Erivara, and myself. And there are about 10 papers in there with a very wide range of uh, topics. But basically, the, 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 the objective of the special issue was to show how we can bring some of the concepts from strategy process research together with some of the concepts from strategy fact as practice research. Uh, what, we, what we showed was the perhaps three different um, ways of thinking about the relationship between strategy as process and strategy as practice research. We could see them as somewhat un antagonistic, so in contest, we could see them in a complementary relationship or we could see them in a, in a combinatory framework, the sort of combinatory framework which is on the slide. So here you have some typical strategy process issues. So if you remember um, concepts, you have issues, which is a, a central concept in strategic issue management, which is a strong tradition within strategy process research. You have right in the middle, you have strategy formation process with the kind of um, Minzbergian approach to realize strategy uh, emerging from here. We have particular strategizing episodes, but there also, uh, as well as these classic strategy process uh, components, we also have the kinds of things that you see in strategy as practice research, various practices. Here we emphasize the discursive and the socio material kinds of practices. Um, and we also have practitioners, or we call them here actors, managers, consultants, and various employees at various levels within the organization. So here we have in this combinatory framework, we try and bring together to explain what happens in terms of realized strategy as a result of both process type concepts, realized strategy, um, strategic issues, and strategy as practice concepts, practitioners or actors, and practices as well. So what happens as a realized strategy is a result of both what we can see in strategy process research and strategy as practice research. And we call this combinatory framework, strategy as practice and process. Um, trying to show the benefits of bringing the two traditions together. So whereas I think at one point in the strategy as practice research tradition, we tended to see strategy as practice as somewhat separate from the strategy of process tradition. I think what we were trying to argue in the strategic management journal special issue was there's a great deal of potential in bringing those two traditions together. Okay, so that's one set of relationships between um, micro and macro traditions. The second set of relationships might be, this is more macro, I think. Institutional theory is typically concerned with large changes um, or organizational field changes crossing many organizations um, of a particular type. I think of Michael Lounsby's work on the rise of different kinds of financial institutions in North America. There's a whole set of work on uh, the rise of green and environmental concerns in the late 1990s. There's another tradition on the spread of the multi-divisional firm. I associate particularly with Murph Figstein. There's a what uh, there's, um, in other words, there's a rich tradition of institutional theory, which looks at new practices, new institutions, as they cross whole societies. I think strategy as practice can connect with that. And Michael Smets has been particularly influential in um, developing what he calls practice-driven institutionalism. And, and what we've tried to do, in fact, uh, Michael Smets, Angela Aristudu, and myself in a, in a fairly recent article on practice-driven institutionalism, is try to bring together institutionalism with practice theory. Other people who've done this sort of work are David Seidel um, and uh, Roy Sudeby and Jane Lee, who've um, 
done some work in strategic organization, which has drawn links between institutional theory and strategist practice work. So what practice driven institutionalism is, is interested in is how the everyday work of practitioners on the ground, praxis, if you like, is the engine room of social order and the practices by which, social, which jobs get done. In other words, what they're saying is practices which govern orders, social order, and provide the resources for the jobs which we need to get done are created by practitioners in their everyday work, in their everyday improvisations, their everyday adaptations, of, in their everyday innovations, if you like, that they um, carry out as they do their ordinary jobs. So practice-driven institutionalism is very much a bottom-up approach to relating um, micro work to macro practices. And a very good example of that is the work that Michael Smets has done in the Academy Management Journal in how a particular law firm has uh, created new practices through the everyday um, adaptations of lawyers working on particular jobs um, in their law firm. Okay, so we can connect then, I think, with at least two other traditions, a macro perspective of institutional theory and a more micro perspective, uh, well, not necessarily micro perspective, but organizational level perspective of strategy process research. This is taking me, I think, to the methodologies question and part of the agenda. Strategies practice research, partly because of its strengths in micro strategizing, has been very innovative in the kinds of uh, research methodologies it's used. There's been a great deal of work which has used, for instance, video ethnography. Curtis LeBaron um, has been a pioneer on that, and he's a co author with Saki Mantri and others of an article in the Strategic Management Journal a couple of years back on how you can use video ethnography in strategy research. Here, though, I, I'm featuring in a particular concrete example by, again, Paula Jarzakowski and colleagues, where they look at, to go back to the insurance industry, the way that strategizing work happens in very material circumstances. So what you see here is a couple of episodes that they analyze quite carefully, which have been videoed. And the, um, the faces are deliberately blurred, provide some anonymity. But what's very important is in their study is how the work they do is facilitated by access to particular documents, which they use physically. They prefer not to use computers here. They're physically close to each other. They're using pens. They're showing things. Um, uh, they're even uh, annotating and amending each other's documents as they go along. What they're doing is a very intimate kind of socio-material practice in which physical co-location, uh, physical artifacts are extremely important in achieving the strategizing work. So Paula and her colleagues have been very successful in showing that strategy is not purely a conceptual or cognitive process, one of great visions and so on and so forth, or uh, remote analysis, but is actually something which is intimate, socio-material laden with artifacts and depends upon those. Um, I can also recommend work by Paula Jarzakowski and Sarah Kaplan and Sarah Kaplan in the Strategic Management Journal quite recently, in which they show the same using PowerPoint um, or illustrating the way in which PowerPoints are used. Similarly, Satiris Perutis has published work um, uh, on PowerPoint in the Strategic Management Journal as well. So all this is great. This is um, in-depth ethnography using video cameras to record exactly what's happening and very vividly and revealingly so. But that's very useful if you want to show that uh, strategizing work depends upon a material and social world. But you might want to look at some other things. So my own work has also used um, very conventional econometrics. So for instance, I'm just citing here a, a long range planning article, which couldn't be more abstract, couldn't be more quantitative, and could hardly be more different 
to Paula's work with Burke and Spee. What we did there was we looked at 40 years of um, job advertisements for strategic planners, and we pulled out various characteristics of the jobs, job advertisements, such, such as how important forecasting was, how important analysis was, how much economic, economic, economic skills were in the job description, and also where the jobs were located, whether they're located in central headquarters or whether they were um, more decentralized, perhaps in divisional level. And what we looked at was how the increasing turbulence, that is the environmental dynamism uh, of the last 40 years has affected the particular demand for skills such as forecasting, analysis or economics, uh, and the location of the job roles, whether they're centralized or decentralized into um, divisions. What we found was that rising turbulence, increasing dynamism in the environment was negatively associated with forecasting analysis and economics of skills amongst strategic planners and was negatively um, related to the degree to which those roles were centralized. Now, that's kind of interesting. If, you're in, if you believe that um, we are interested or we should be interested in the kind of skills that people need in order to carry out strategic planning type roles, which still exist in almost all large corporations. What we find is economics and analysis are getting gradually less important according to the rise of secular, or the secular rise of turbulence in environments. That might mean, indeed, we, we go on to show that softer skills such, uh, such as communication skills are important. Now, that's very, very broad brush. And maybe, although it's uh, an econometric study, uh, very much at the macro level across many, many organizations, many, many job advertisements, I think we looked at about 4,000 of them, are what that shows is, or at least begins to point you to, is a shift in the nature of skills that strategy practitioners need. And if that's what you're interested in, strategy practitioner skills, this would be one way of approaching it. So, strategy as practice of research needs all, all kinds of methodology. Micro research tends to be ethnographic. That's great. That's what Paula Jarzakowski and many other people are doing. Macro um, strategy as practice of research might adopt different kinds of methodologies. Econometric, broadly historical, um, multi-case study. You can imagine all sorts of research um, along those lines. Basically, strategies practice is not ideological about the kinds of methodology one should, one should use. What it allows is many different methodologies according to the questions in hand. Now, I'm not quite sure whether we got any more questions. I'm just going to check whether we got got some more. Um, and then we'll be nearly finished. So here's my my uh, query here. OK, I've got an, a, a, a new question here. In a book chat of, of the new book, Opening Strategy, you refer to open strategy as a macro practice. That's right. Ma uh, open strategy is a macro practice in the book. If everyday micro practices constitute the big strategy, as Paula would uh, argue, can I also consider open strategy and the doing of inclusion and, and transparency, which are elements of open strategy, to be micro? Or I, should I always consider it to be macro? Good question. So macro um, open strategies are a macro practice, just like strategic planning is. Should I consider it as always macro or can you consider it as micro? So the answer to that is like with any macro practice, they're always, they've got two heads. We can think of open strategy, strategic management, um, strategic planning as macro practices. But in every instance of praxis, in every organization, in every particular episode, it is always a micro practice or an episode of praxis. Every time a practice, a macro practice is used, it's used differently. 
in every organization it's used differently but there is some core which is common across every instance every episode every particular example so the common core of open strategy are the kinds of things that are referred to in the question degrees of inclusion the extent to which people are able to participate in the strategizing degrees of transparency the extent to which information um, data are open to the world or open within the organization um, there's a common core which defines these as instances of the macro practice of open strategy but the degree to which there is inclusion the mode to which inclusion is enabled the degree to which there is transparency the kinds of transparency which are made available in each case are going to be different so in that sense any macro pra practice is always empirically a specific kind of micro exemplification of that macro practice so practices in that sense or in the sense that i'm dealing with in the book are always two-headed they're both macro they have a common core strategic planning has a common core of analysis strategic management has a common core of a focus on learning and change open strategy has a common core of being concerned with inclusion of more participants and transparency with regard to information but each time they're done in each particular episode they're different so you need to consider empirically micro cases as well each have their specific characteristics even if they share that common core so i think that's a reasonable response to that that question um, ma my macro practices empirically always instantiate themselves in specific ways in micro episodes. Now, let me go back to my agenda and just sum it up, sum uh, summarize. What I've tried to talk about is micro and macro as theoretical categories, thinking of those very rough analogies to microeconomics and macroeconomics. Macro crossing many organizations, micro happening at the specific organizational level we can relate micro activities and macro practices in many ways i've mentioned the top-down approach of andrea herapath and the more um, bottom-up approach of paula jarsakovsky there's also a more reciprocal approach the kind of approach that um, i've exemplified in my book opening strategy there are many ways of doing it what are we trying to explain? Well, more than firm performance, the effectiveness of practitioners, the success of particular practices, macro practices, um, and the way in which a macro practice can be instantiated in a particular situation as well, the kind of thing I was talking about a moment ago. How to connect with other theoretical traditions? Well, I've shown the Strategic Management Journal special issue example the framework of our combinatory framework which allows strategies practice to connect with strategy process research and michael smetz's work on practice driven institutionalism indicates the ways in which we can connect institutional theory with practice theory as well so look up michael smetz's work what kinds of methodologies might we adopt well that depends on the kind of thing you're trying to explain uh, there's a lot of ethnographic work which is used that's great very fascinating is the video ethnography which is becoming more and more common but there's also opportunities according to the question we're trying to address to do econometric work multiple case study work um the larger brush kinds of research as well so i think there's a broad agenda many ways of pursuing strategy as practice research my argument here is to do um, micro strategy research and macro strategy as practice research as far as possible to bring them together um, there's an agenda which i think is quite exciting and we seem to be recruiting more and more people doing strategy as practice research over time if you compare the number of citations from 2009 to 2018 there's been a pretty strong upward trend um, I urge you to keep doing that work, 
I wish you the best of luck with that. I hope this particular webinar will be of some help to you in doing all that. Um, in a moment, I'm going to wave you goodbye if I can, can make the technology work. Here it is. Um, wish you good luck and recommend both the webinar that Paula Jarzakowska has already done. I think that's going to be available on the Academy of Management Connect site. And I recommend you also to look out for the webinar, which is forthcoming in a couple of weeks' time from David Seidel, which again will be available on the Academy of Management Connect site. So I um, hope that's been useful. Looking forward to any feedback and uh, good luck with the research. Bye-bye for now.